Good morning, Lizzo. It's such Morning. a pleasure to have you on board today with me for a quick interview regarding the upcoming 10th ACAC annual meeting. And thank you so much for taking out time for me today. So let's begin by getting to know a little bit about yourself. And I would love to start with some brief overview of your professional background. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the, the invitation and also the opportunity to do this interview. So I'm Lisa Detora. Um, I was just promoted to professor of writing studies and rhetoric. At, I'm at Hofstra University in New York. I'm the first author of the Good Publication Practice for Company-Sponsored Research that came out in 2022. I'm also the lead editor of a book on regulatory writing that comes out from Regulatory Affairs Professional Society. My doctorate's in English, and I have some decades of industry experience as well as a pretty solid portfolio of scholarly works in various fields like technical communication and medical rhetoric in addition to the work that I do in scientific writing. That's great. You have picked an excellent topic for the upcoming meeting, equity in academia. So would you mind to share some highlights of your presentation with me? Um, sure. So when I think about kind of like equity in the scholarly publishing area, we did just do a paper with um, the Committee on Publication Ethics, kind of thinking about language and how English language as the dominant language creates spaces that are inequitable for a lot of scholars and a lot of researchers. So I wanted to mention that. But another thing I'm interested in is how do ethics differ in different cultural contexts? So there's like a main kind of body of bioethics, but it's very focused on the Western context. And it's also very focused on a kind of autonomy or individual autonomy that reads quite well in the West. So in the EU and the US and Canada, but it might not always work in all different cultures. So you could think about things like the informed consent process in research. So in many cultures, it would be quite alien to just make that decision for yourself. You would go back and consult with your family and you would consult possibly with you know, your your other physicians before you would make a decision on your own. So for me, I'm like, that's interesting because it could extend into questions like authorship. So if you exist in a cultural context that really values cooperation and doesn't make it so much about one individual person, then the way that you think about the ethics of authorship might be very different in some cultural context as compared with what we think of or what I think of as a dominant way of looking at that. Interesting. So in your view, what are the main challenges that are currently faced by underrepresented groups, maybe in scholarly publishing? And what should be the effective steps we should take to address these challenges? Okay, well, so thank you for this question. It's a very big question, though. So for me, the main issue for underrepresented groups is that they're basically invisible. So and even the steps that are taken to try to start to make people more visible mean that they're not being recognized separately. So we get these categories like Pacific Islander or indigenous people or Asian, and those categories collapse a lot of very, very diverse groups. So if you're a member of one of those groups, there's no specific visibility for the interests or the problems that are faced by your group. And sometimes the populations are just so minoritized that it becomes very difficult to communicate. So if people live and work in like a language family that very few people speak, it makes it very, very difficult to engage in scholarly activity or to even find scholarly publishing that would apply to that group. Um, so I think language is a huge barrier. I gave a talk a few years ago about the problems of the plain language summary. So one of the issues for that is that for many languages, there's no medical language that's used in that culture because that culture uses English as the medical language. So even the health practitioners use English. So that's a barrier to creating documentation in individual languages that people can use. 
Um, I'm not sure what to do specifically about it. I think that kind of attending or paying attention to the fact that this exists as a problem is probably the biggest first step. And I know that groups like the International Council on Harmonization for Technical Requirements for Human Use is quite interested in these kinds of questions as are other editorial groups. So like the ICMJE for ex mm -hmm. instance, or the World Association of Medical Editors. That's great. So um, in a sense of uh, seeing that AI has been dominating uh, the publishing whole ecosystem, how do you see that emerging technologies and open access initiatives, they can contribute to more in academic or equitable academic publishing landscape? Okay, so thank you for this question as well. When I prepared the answer for this question, I was thinking about actually the barriers that um, are created now when we're thinking about AI and emerging technologies, because technology can open access to more people, but this is only true in a developed region where people have access to broadband. So even in the United States, and that's a very wealthy country overall, many people lack basic access to the internet because either the internet infrastructure doesn't exist or they can't afford an up-to-date device to access the internet. So I think that would be something that needs to be overcome to really kind of allow um, emerging technologies like AI to foster a more equitable academic publishing landscape. But the open access initiatives to me, they're great for people who already have access to medical education in various countries. So for medical students, this is fabulous because now they have access to all of the work that they need and their institutions don't need to spend a lot of money that they may not have to get access to journals. However, there's also a large expense passed on to authors. So it can be $10,000 for some of the higher tier journals. And that means that there's the same barriers to getting funding for research or also applying to getting published, particularly in higher tier journals. So one of the things I think might be helpful is going back to the idea that um, if you're paying an open access fee, that's for like an initial period and that maybe more things should become open access after one year or two years, even if the authors can't afford to pay those fees. Um, I hope that that was a helpful answer to the question. I think your talk is going to be very much insightful and we will hear more about it at the meeting. So um, for a few questions regarding the ACAC annual meeting platform, uh, what motivated you to participate in the upcoming 10th ACAC annual meeting? Um, so my grandmother's Aunt May told me that whenever anyone kindly invites you to something, you go to that thing. So um, that's one big reason. But also, I just think that ACSE is a really wonderful group. So I'm just so honored to be included. So I just want to come and meet people and to hear about the exciting work that's going on. That's great. So are there any sessions or talks that you are excited about? Any specific session that you're looking forward to? So I did look back at the schedule when I saw this question and I was like, these sessions all look so good. It's such an excellent group of experts and I'm just really excited to be able to see also how all the sessions work together and to be able to hear from so many top experts and from locations like geographic locations where I don't often get to interact with people. So I think it's for me particularly important as someone in the U.S. And I also live in New York. So to be able to um, interact with people from other contexts. As an expert, you have been attending uh, a lot of events, uh, especially in your region. So uh, in your opinion, what do you think that the uh, sort of events like ACAC annual meeting, how beneficial are they for networking point of view for editors, publishers, and especially the publishing community? Oh, I think it's highly valuable. Um, when I saw the question, I thought through, it's like, well, why do you go to a meeting? Well, often if you're an editor, you're working in isolation mm -hmm. and or you're the only editor on a multidisciplinary team. So it gives you an opportunity to interact with your peers, but also it's not the direct work context. So you have an opportunity to interact with people in different roles in just kind of a different way. Maybe you can hear more about how they think about their role that you don't have time to get into in day-to-day -day, um, 
working relationships, but also I think a lot of people really work in isolation. Like you're working like very much in one very local context Mm -hmm. and it gives you something to bring back to your local team and also the opportunity to bring the views of your local team to other people so that you can have some recognition. Thank you so much, Leza, for sharing your insight with us today. And I must say that your expertise and perspective are invaluable for the upcoming meeting. So let's wait for your excellent presentation and the important discussion it will inspire. So have safe travel and we will see you soon in Dubai. Great. Thank you so much. 